Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert, joining you from Quito, Ecuador. Last Tuesday, the African National Congress of South Africa, the ANC, had its 54th national conference, and Cyril Ramaphosa became its president by a narrow margin, replacing Jacob Zuma, the current president of South Africa, as head of the ANC. Many say it's not a foregone conclusion now that Ramaphosa will be the ANC's next presidential candidate in 2019. As a successful businessman, Cyril Ramaphosa is strongly connected to the Lundman Mining Company. Professor Patrick Bond of Wits University in South Africa analyzes this connection in a recently published article, In South Africa, Ramaphosa Rises as Lundman Expires. Joining me now is Patrick Bond, the author and also the co-editor of BRICS, an anti-capitalist critique. Welcome, Patrick. Great to be with you, Greg. Thanks. So recently we spoke to Glenn Ford here on The Real News uh, about uh, uh, Ramaphosa's election. And he said uh, that the word that hangs over Ramaphosa's head is capture. Uh, do you agree that Ramaphosa is captured by multinational corporate interests and uh, such as the mining sector? Yes, that's been the case, particularly since he became the major investor in Lawnmen. Uh, and that's a company that more or less went bankrupt Last week, it was taken over for about 1.4 cents uh, on the dollar in the sense that it in 27 had a much higher capital um, uh, share value. And in that process in 2012, Ramaphosa was implicated, as Glenn pointed out, in the massacre of 34 mine workers, because the day before that massacre happened on August 15, 2012, he sent some incriminating emails uh, to the police that asked for quote, concomitant action against, quote, dastardly criminals, by which he meant about 4,000 wildcat strikers. In fact, strikers who'd left his union, the union that he had brought to greatness in the 1980s. And in that massacre, and by the way, Ramaphosa did apologize this year for those emails, but uh, not only did 34 uh, mine workers die and, and 78 were gravely injured, but it really shook up South African politics and it broke a left flank away that included both the economic freedom fighters, the new party that's getting about eight to 10% of the vote, uh, but also the metal workers, the biggest trade union uh, with about 330,000 members, they split largely because of the class relations that Ramaphosa unveiled. That is that the South African state had become very much a collaborator with multinational capital, in this case, a company that was once called the unacceptable face of capitalism by a British Tory prime minister. And that, in a sense, gives you, in just that one instance, uh, in uh, August 2012, five years ago, the tragic uh, relationship of Cyril Ramaphosa to money and power. Um, given these kinds of accusations against him or his, uh, his involvement really both in the mining company and also in the, in the Americana massacre, how is it possible or how was it possible that uh, Ramaphosa was nonetheless able to win uh, the election for the ANC presidency? Well, to get to that answer requires us to quickly review the two camps that have been contesting this election. And that includes the camp led by Nkasazana Dlamini Zuma, who is an ex-wife of President Zuma, but also more importantly for the former foreign minister and home affairs minister and health minister and the chair of the African Union until recently. A very impressive woman in her own right. But she was seen as connected to the state capture group of the Gupta brothers and the network around them, a patronage-based group. In fact, there became a slogan, the Zuptas, to reflect how the Zuma family had benefited from their relationship, very corrupt, often involving tenders or uh, outsourcing and contracts with major state agencies. And that was the group that nearly won, and indeed, you could say, won on uh, several counts, including the Secretary General of the ANC elected uh, this week, Ace Magashule, his deputy, uh, whose name is uh, Jesse Duarte, and they're both very connected to the Guptas, as well as Cyril Ramaphosa's deputy president, David Mabuza, who has a big corruption history uh, surrounding uh, his role in the ANC. So we've seen Cyril Ramaphosa come to the presidency barely beating uh, in Kasazana de la Minizuma, 51 to 49, but three others from the opposing camp, the Zuptas, actually winning major positions in the ANC. Hence, it's a stalemate in this important ruling party. A party, by the way, that hasn't lost an election since it came to power with Nelson Mandela in 1994, 
but the next election, 2019, will be very close. If they go under 50%, there may be a coalition of opposition parties. And that was what uh, many in the ANC feared and why they thought Ramaphosa would be their best bet to avoid that. Well, it seems that one of the main uh, reasons that he won was his uh, emphasis or his opposition to uh, to corruption, although he doesn't really have that, seem to have so much of a track record on that issue. But how likely do you think will he actually crack down on uh, corruption within the ANC? Well, the very big test is whether he will manage to persuade or even fire Jacob Zuma, persuade him to leave office uh, before his term ends, which is in middle of 2019. And this is what happened to Jacob Zuma's predecessor, Thabo Mbeki, when Zuma's people uh, more or less voted him out, redeployed him, and had him fired as the state president of South Africa about nine months before his term ended in 2009. So that's the number one objective of the critics of Zuma and the Zuptas, and that's especially big business critics. However, there are a lot of other steps that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa will be taking in the coming weeks, including replacing the national prosecutor and getting a state capture inquiry underway that will put pressure probably not just on Jacob Zuma, but on Ace Magashule from the Free State province and others that are very important. So whether this is going to be a force of unity, this ANC, or an ongoing set of splits and contestations between these two camps uh, remain, remains to be seen. I don't think they're going to make much progress. I think it'll be a rather constipated period. And that's where the opposition, both the center-right Democratic Alliance, that's getting in the sort of 25% range, and the uh, far left, the economic freedom fighters, may be able to get some attraction before 2019. But let's not forget that the major question is whether Cyril Ramaphosa will impose austerity as the president in waiting, as the current deputy president of the country, with influence over the finance ministry. We'll know that in February when the next budget comes. And hinging on how much austerity is imposed is another chance at a junk rating, which scares business because that invariably means the currency comes under pressure, interest rates go up, and uh, the long, slow recession that we've been in, uh, very low growth or negative growth over the past couple of years, will continue and capital flight will worsen. Unemployment is at uh, the highest levels in the industrial world, nearly 40 percent, and protests are breaking out everywhere. And it's a question of whether they can keep the lid on this boil, which um, I'm not sure they can, given how much dissent there is even a little bit of uh, relief for the ANC from having a new president, a fresh face. But no, it's fairly obvious to answer your question. Cyril Ramaphosa is not going to make much progress fighting corruption since it's so deeply embedded in this ruling party. Well, it sounds like he's also going to steer more towards uh, a neoliberal direction or uh, continue the existing neoliberal direction of the ANC. Did you, uh, or, and, and this would provoke a reaction, perhaps. So does that mean that the ANC could actually lose an election the next time around? Possibly, but the critical question is whether the various fragmented forces will come together. And we'll see some of that very soon. For the reason that when Lawnmin uh, went bankrupt effectively, was bought by another company for a fraction of its former value. Uh, that company is called uh, Sibanyi. It's a local gold company. And they've promised to fire 40% of the Lawnmin workers. And these are tough workers uh, who've been through the most uh, amazing battles, a five-month platinum strike in 2014. And they've also retracted some of the commitments they've made to community investment. And and again, very tough areas northwest of Johannesburg in the big platinum belt. So I'm anticipating some worker community and especially feminist unity. There are some very strong women's group uh, like Sikala Sonke, We Cry Together, that are already signaling they won't uh, put up with yet more uh, exploitation by this new platinum company taking over from Lawnmin. So that's one of the sites of struggle. I must say another is that the students who had demanded free tertiary education seem to have won. But they're going to have to fight even harder in 2018 to make sure that promises made this week by Jacob Zuma on his way out for free tertiary education are kept. And this is very controversial because it'll cost about a billion dollars this year and more in the next couple of years. And the big debate that's going on, especially in the business community, is where will that money come from? Uh, because big business isn't so uh, uh, committed to making tertiary education more available that it would agree to a further budget deficit. We're at about a 4.2% budget deficit, and the promises to the big ratings agencies, uh, Moody's 
Standard and Poor's and Fitch, who seem to have an excess of power in this, is that we would be decreasing it below 3%, and that extra billion dollars will break that budget. So a huge contest over whether we'll see increases in the value added tax or more austerity or both, and that too will generate protests uh, February, March, April, I can safely predict. Hmm. Okay, well, we'll continue to follow the situation. I was talking to Patrick Bond, Professor of Political Economy at Wits University in South Africa. Thanks so much for being here today, Patrick. Great to be with you, Greg. And thank you for joining The Real News Network. If you like the news and analysis that we provide, please donate to The Real News Network this holiday season.